Welcome, friends, colleagues, and distinguished guests. I am Jean-Pierre Bardet, Dean of the College of Engineering, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the University of Miami for today's special events about a new technology that is about to transform your lives. Now, in January 2007, about 11 years ago, Steve Jobs, CEO of Apple Computers, unveiled the iPhone. He called it a revolutionary and magical product. Hard to disagree with Steve. Smartphones have indeed transformed our lives. Today, there is another revolutionary and magical technology which will also transform your lives. I discovered it about three years ago when I met Ronnie Abovitz, right here in South Florida. Ronnie is an alumni of the College of Engineering. He is also the CEO and founder of Magic Leap, the largest startup ever. Forbes called Magic Leap a disruption machine for every market. Magic Leap is shaking up the $1 trillion consumer electronics industry and many more. It certainly disrupted our friends at the college, at the School of Architecture, who graciously surrendered their space for hosting this event. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Elkuri, for lending us your space. So Magic Leap is more than 3D animated images mixed with reality, more than 3D uh, video games, and much more than very wearable mixed reality devices. Magic Leap calls its technology spatial computing. It's a, a human-centered artificial intelligence. It's an information network connected to the physical world. And it closely interacts with your brain in emotion in ways no other technology can. So Magic Leap has the potential of transforming all our activities, be it for work or entertainment. So it's no surprise that it generated widespread enthusiasm from faculty and students from old schools and college at the University of Miami. In medicine, we can imagine it will streamline the operating theater while giving surgeons immediate access to information where they need it the most, right on top of the patients. In sales and marketing, it will bring furniture and clothes into your living room so you can visualize them in real world setting. In, in educational settings, it can bring the past to life in a vivid way. Just imagine our family interacting with a dinosaur skeleton, just like in the movie, A Night in the Museum. So we are excited to have you join today for a fascinating discussion about spatial computing, the future of learning, and a transformative new academic alliance between the University of Miami and Magic Leap. Guiding the conversation today will be the Executive Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost at the University of Miami, Jeffrey Dirk. <laughs> Provost Dirk is a former dean of the School of Engineering at Case Western Reserve University. He is an accomplished engineer and scientist with deep appreciation for the social sciences, the art, and the humanities. Throughout his career, he has promoted many interdisciplinary research and educational initiatives. In 2011, he was inducted as a fellow into the National Academy of Inventors, which recognizes innovation in scientific discovery. And just last month, the Alumni Association of Case Western Reserve University awarded him a Lifetime Service Award. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Provost Jeff Dirk. Thank you. 
Well, my first duty is to introduce our two speakers today. The first is President Julio Frank, our two participants. And the second, as JP discussed or described, is the CEO of Magic Leap, Roni Abovic. So if I could have both of you come up. Thank you. So, so as an engineer, I'm particularly gratified that it's not University of Miami and Magic Leap, it's University of Miami times Magic Leap. <laughs> it's that additional power that we get from the, the multiplicative effect of both of those. So Julio, I'm gonna ask you the first question. At your inauguration almost three years ago, you introduced the idea of University of Miami's geographic endowment. Can you explain how this relates to Miami and in particular South Florida in general? Sure, um, I mean, for me, <clears throat> uh, it was clear from the very beginning, even in my first interactions with the Board of Trustees, that this university has a strategic advantage in its location at this particular city, not only one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world, but also a city that, has, that, that is defined by its geography, because Miami is exactly at the crossroads of the Americas. But it is also on the eastern seaboard. And um, uh, Rosebeth Moss Cantor, the famous uh, Harvard Business School professor who actually spends quite a bit of time here, in a book called World Class that describes a series of, of cities that are truly global cities but that are also very connected to their local communities, she describes Miami as a pan-hemispheric city, by which she means that it is obviously on the Western Hemisphere, it's the crossroads of the Americas, it really has this central location. But because it's also on the Eastern Seaboard, it faces Europe and Africa and through that, the old world. And therefore, it is this amazing cap capacity to be a connector around the world that I think shapes the idea of, of Miami. And for us, being located in this city, I think provides a geographic endowment. That's why I introduced that concept of the inauguration. Now, we've heard this project is going to be called the Project Alexandria. Can you sure, share with us where that comes from? Sure. Um, in one of the many, many exciting conversations I've had with Ronnie, I was reflecting on this power of place and, uh, and, and seeing how if you look in history, at where the most important cities are located, most of the times, this is a product of chance. You know, a historical event that led to Paris being where it is, or London, usually near a body of water. And yet, there is one example, historically, of a city that was, whose location was selected on the basis of a strategic choice, and that's Alexandria. Alexander the Great wanted to found a city that was exactly at the intersection, in that case, of East and West. And that's why he founded the city that bears his name exactly in the spot it was. It was meant to be a connector. It was a city that was defined by its geography. I think of Miami as the Alexandria of the 21st century, a city that's not only defined by its geography, but that, like the original Alexandria, First, at the original Alexandria House, the famous library, so it was a center of learning. And secondly, it had the lighthouse, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a beacon. And I see our, our city exactly fulfilling that role. So I was more or less chatting about this, and Ronnie came up with the idea of saying, let's call our collaboration Project Alexandria. And that's the origin of the name. So this, this idea of the power of place is really important. Can you talk, a talk about it a little bit in terms of the friction or the lack of friction that place enables? Well, you know, we, we've, we've almost come, become accustomed to this idea that place doesn't matter, but place does matter. And in Miami, it's defined by its place, like Alexandria. It's, it, it, the geography defines its character, and its, its mission and its role in the world. So place does matter. But the fascinating thing that I find about what you're about to hear from Ronnie, who's really the amazing creator of this technology, is that while it recognizes 
the importance of place, hence the term spatial computing, and he will obviously explain something that I only superficially understand. But to me, what that creates is an incredible paradox. And it is the paradox of how, through the importance of place, we can actually, by connecting people in different places, eliminate the friction of space. And, and that is a fascinating paradox, using the power of place to eliminate the friction of distance and bringing people together. So Ronnie, in, in your experience, I mean, this is your second, at least your second startup, you must have been pushed to locate perhaps in Silicon Valley or somewhere on the West Coast, and yet you chose South Florida. It, it was almost an act of complete defiance to stay here. Um, <laughs> I think I made it like, well, when I did my first uh, company, which I really started at the, at the at, you know, graduate school here, um, doing robotics, it was a nearly impossible act to try to do that. Um, and that helped pave the way a little bit for doing magically. But still, every, every investor was like, why aren't you just coming out to San Francisco or the Valley? Or just don't do it in Miami. That's completely not what you should be doing. But what's kind of interesting, first of all, as soon as someone tells me I shouldn't do something, I want to do that. <laughs> um, but it's also like I think staying here, we've seen Miami change. Uh, Miami is now like filled with startups and creativity, and you know it's it, there's a really uh, interesting new thing that can happen here that isn't already a pattern of behavior somewhere else. I like that. That I also had a feeling there was something here, um, and I think um, Dr. Frank articulated it when he's explaining to me the power of place. Uh, about what made Miami special and this like pan hemispheric pull that was like I was intuitively feeling I didn't know how to articulate. Like there's a part of the world that like isn't the Silk Belt Road and isn't the valley that people forgot about kind of, but has like, you know, a huge population and a massive economy and why couldn't this be the center of it? So I think we're now putting articulation to that intuition. So so in who in one of the slides report, it's actually the one here. You see Miami sort of looking east and looking south, and yet in Silicon Valley, it would sort of be looking definitely further east. Yes. Or west, I guess. Talk to us a little bit more about sort of the, the difference in culture, for example. You have the Silicon Valley people who may look to China. Here, there may be no perspective, and does that sort of virgin space offer opportunities for Magic Leap? Well, you think, you think Miami is a hub you pull from, you know, people obviously think Miami could be a capital of all of Latin America and the Caribbean and parts of Central America, like as a center of economic opportunity or growth. So that's kind of interesting, but it's also a pull to and across Europe and a pull up and down the Eastern seaboard all the way into Canada. And if you, know, if you think about that radius, it could be really interesting. And you know, that's not um, on the other side of the country, mm -hmm. it's not in you know in the east where there's like you know the whole Silk Belt Road is being defined. It's just a part people are going well that 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 isn't something we're really putting a lot of focus on. So I thought what was really cool about this project is it puts extreme focus on it uh, and first defines the cultural and economic influence of this whole region, um, which uh, we do spatial computing. So the idea of place and physicality actually matters, um, and, and we'll definitely talk through that. So the, the Earth is in a unique place in our solar system, which is in a unique, unique place in the universe. We've heard Magic Leap talk about a magic verse. How would you describe what a magic verse is? So uh, let, me, um, let, let me pop into a couple things and explain what we do and work the way to magic verse, because our collaboration with the University of Miami, uh, what, what is the focus of Alexandria is to turn the campus into a magic verse campus, so I'll sort of I'll, I'll walk into that explanation. So um, uh, first thing, our mission is we're about harmonizing people and technology. Um, and we're trying to you know, create a better, uh, more unified world. And that you know, reality is, what does that actually mean? It sounds like a nice thing, but like in practice, what does that mean? Uh, so to, get, to understand magic verse, I'm going to talk a little bit about what is spatial computing. And what's really fitting is we're in the architecture school. So I got to meet with the dean um, earlier for, for a brief few minutes. But, to think about what we do in spatial computing, I must have to be like a computer scientist, an interface designer, understand AI, and also understand things like architecture and spatial design. 
which are now separate disciplines, not one unified di discipline yet on campus. So I'll describe like what we think of as what led to our thoughts around spatial computing and what are the tenants, and then what's the magic verse. So I'll, I'll try to go through that quickly. But you'll see here uh, a couple threads converging. You have like sort of heavier computing, like, like workstation and desktop computing, and you've got mobile computing and communication. Um, and you also see the progression of, of high-speed networks. And what's kind of interesting is um, our first system is really like, you know, don't think iPhone, think like Apple 1977. <laughs> like this is sort of where we are right now with this. This is the very beginning of an entirely new way to think about computing. But it converges these two different streams, like the communication stream, uh, the computing stream. And also, it also converges design and experiential streams. Um, and what's interesting is that you're having massive high-speed networks built all over the world, particularly in all the major cities in the U.S. They're going to show up like 2019, 2021. And the question is, what are you going to do with these things? You already are pretty good with, with what we have today with like LTE network. Um, so what are you going to do with like 5G plus, ultra high-speed everywhere, edge computing everywhere, distributed computing everywhere? What, what are you going to do with that? Let me just kind of move the... So we're going to talk a little bit about um, what is spatial computing, why that's relevant, um, what are the tenants, and I'll explain like magic verse and how we see that happening on campus. So there's different words flying around. I'll just try to define them simply and quickly for the audience. But uh, people have probably heard virtual reality. The idea of virtual reality has been around for many, many decades, um, you know, like in just bigger and bigger forms. But it tends to block out the whole world, uh, where you know, today it tends to mean some cell phone-like thing blocking out the world, sticking in front of my eye. Um, and then you go into a different immersive space. So we're not really doing that. And then a lot of people have probably tried with your phone. You hold up your phone, and you might see a little character running around. Um, or you might have an emoji face or something. So augmented reality, which could mean multiple things, is commercially kind of meaning when I hold up my phone and I'm, I'm using some kind of like simplistic, it's almost like a gateway to, to the next thing. And, Spatial computing, and why we're calling it spatial computing and not AR or VR, is you are dealing with the real world. The system senses your environment. Uh, it senses you. Um, and it's allowing objects to exist in a very realistic way in that environment, respect the environment, have physics. Things can go around corners. They can persistently be there. So it has many different qualities that I held up my phone and I saw a little dancing something, like a dancing hot dog. It's, it's something that could be persistently on very large spaces. But the awareness of you and the environment being aware of you um, is very really interesting, because it also incorporates sensing and IoT. It incorporates things like AI in a much more profound way. Uh, so I'll, I'll walk you through the, the tenets of spatial computing, and that will help us understand. There we go. It'll help us understand what is Magicverse and what is Magicverse that you are potentially capable of being. So one of them is persistence. So let's say out there, there is a dragon flying between those trees, which there is, which you'll get to see in the mixer afterwards. It's a full-size dragon <laughs> flying over there. Um, so it's there right now. You just don't see it. But if you put on a system, you'll see it there later. Uh, so something could persistently be there. And every student professor could leave things, digital things, all over campus. Let's say I'm an architecture student. I could take my project. I could add 20 stories to that building and leave that there and say that that's there and I want to share that with all the campus and it's going to be there for the next 50 years. Even if that building is knocked down, my digital building is always there. So they have being this pers persistent in, like, in space at this place, which is really interesting. Uh, scale. So we, we were talking about scale in that example. We're not showing a tiny sticker of a dragon. There is like a big like truck-sized dragon flying between those trees. Um, if you, and everyone needs to go see this, we have um, in the gym at the Wellness Center a full-size like humpback whale jumping out of the floor crashing. So you'll see scale, um, which is kind of amazing because you, 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 your phone is not scale. You don't get a scaled experience. You, you can't design something like if you're an automotive engineer, I can't put a full-size car on the floor. Um, with spatial computing, you could. Awareness is incredibly interesting. That means computing is aware of you and the environment. And that has to do with sensing uh, a field called perception, which is computer vision and AI and a lot of very fancy deep learning. Um, interactivity, I think, of a slightly different from awareness. Interactivity is like 
if I move through space, if I, if I wave my hand, if I say something, the input-output modalities, um, way more than a phone or way more than a laptop, you're shaking your head, your pupils, breathing, are all new input-output modalities. Mm -hmm. uh, you could read someone's emotional state. You could know if someone who has ADD that they're not paying attention. You could detect autism because they're not looking at someone in the eye directly. All these subtle cues can be detected in this kind of computing. Um, respect is something that's not technical, but it's something we believe should be part of spatial computing. You should respect privacy, respect human physiology, you should respect the environment. We think it's, we want to add a sense of ethics and non-technical component to this field. Sentience, which really needs the respect, is the idea that we're in an era that AI is coming awake and alive. And a couple of the UM folks were in our conference in Los Angeles where they met Micah, who's a, an AI who appears there, and Micah really does begin to kind of come awake. Mm -hmm. And I think that requires a campus level of philosophy and computer science, sociology. What does it mean? And in 10 years, like we're talking like a 10-year uh, span for Alexandra and hopefully longer, will you see AIs walking across campus having conversations with students? Um, and then the idea of presence is really interesting. Presence is something is not just a piece of data, um, it's there. So we, we have something called avatar chat where you will be conversing with someone on the other side of campus but they will be present. And what's really interesting about co-presence is you can imagine having a lecturer from Harvard or Stanford or from the Sorbonne just show up in the middle of a class and just like there's another professor just stand there and talk to the students, just this person won't have atoms. So you'll get to see the first manifestation of that. We're running it um, all week. And then how does that apply to Magicverse? I'll try to go through that really quickly. Whoops. So we have a little video that says, what is the Magicverse? Which, of course, is crashing. <laughs> you always have to have a glitch, right? Something's always got to glitch a little bit. So I think what's very interesting about the potential of the campus is it's a system of systems, meaning we're not interested only in like a single person with a single device. What is the entire ecology of like the whole campus population, all the professors and faculty and staff, and the whole physicality and the infrastructure of the university if it was all integrated? Uh, so one of the things that we, we talk about as a magic verse definition is there is one physical instance of UM and there should be one digital instance of UM, which is like the digital singleton. That's the access point, almost like the platform for development. Think of that as like UM digital zero. But then there's an infinite amount of magic verses UM students and faculty can build anywhere on top of and extend the UM campus to anywhere in the world, to other universities, to your house, to virtual worlds that don't even exist. And that becomes really interesting where you ground the digital world in something physical, you have that one digital singleton. And that digital singleton isn't a static copy. Because, um, you know, the buildings are static, but the weather is always changing. A car just drove by. So how do you have UM sense and become aware of itself? And at some point, the UM magic force will have its own sentience and its own AI and be aware. And then the students will be um, interacting with that kind of thing. And what's, what's really interesting is that there's many layers to it. So it's not a call of engineering thing. It's architecture and art and philosophy and journalism. Um, and every aspect of academics as a society and as a mini universe, which I think is super interesting, you know, is kind of the, the petri dish for how should this unfold into society. Um, and that's what's super interesting to us about uh, partnering with the University of Miami. And we're, we're, super, we're incredibly grateful uh, that you know, this could be the first instance of that in the whole world. So, so besides being a double, double alumnus and being here in South Florida, were there attributes of University of Miami that said it makes sense to, be, to have University of Miami be our first partner and have this period of, ex of time for exclusivity with Magic Leap? Well, I, I think the... <laughs> <laughs> well, I so I think what's very interesting about it is... Um, when, when Dr. Frank was describing why certain parts of the earth attract things, 
due to their geographic nature, like they're by rivers or by oceans or just in certain places. And there's a natural, physical, economic, social pull and gravitational field. I thought that what we could do here is amplify that. So I really like your multiplier that you talked about, where spatial computing should amplify human behavior, hopefully the good human behavior, not the, the not good, um, not replace it. So if you think about the economic pull Miami has or the university has, um, can you 10x that or 100x that by applying spatial computing in the right way? And that could be an interesting theory of, of one of the outcomes here. And we'd love to explore that with you guys. So Julio, you have these unique perspectives. You're a physician. You have a daughter or a sister who's a, a musician. You see every day sort of both sides of the brain working, the two hemispheres of the brain working. Are there any parallels there? Absolutely. I mean, what, uh, you know, when, as, as we've been talking about this, this idea of Miami as the pan-hemispheric city came to life. But if you then look the meaning of pan-hemispheric, it's actually a term used in neurology to describe conditions that affect or involve the two hemispheres of the brain. And as I listen to Ronnie, and I never tire of listening to the explanations because they are just fascinating. And let, let me tell you, it was at an eMERGE conference where I first heard you. And what I found fascinating is that this is actually a panhemispheric project in the sense that it both involves the right brain, the, 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 I'm sorry, the left hemisphere, the analytical, scientific, part of you know, applying the most advanced computational techniques and, and the most amazing uh, cutting edge science and engineering. But there's the right hemisphere component, which has to do with the ethical deliberation, the idea and, 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 uh, that you just articulated again, that this has to take into account every, every aspect of the technology and be a step ahead of, of what it is all about. And I remember in that lecture where I first met you that you were actually talking about how artificial intelligence should enhance and not replace human beings. And, and, and every step of the way, you're bringing this sort of uh, thought process stemming from the humanities, from a deep reflection, into what's just an, uh, the most cutting edge technological advance. And in that sense, it is an illustration of that other meaning of being panhemispheric. It's the simultaneous operation, which is what all, all of us should be doing. That's why you know, we were created with two hemispheres, was to integrate. But you, we, we seldom see that integration. Most often, we tend to segregate, and especially in universities, we're very good at building silos. So it is my hope that this project it's going to allow us again to reconnect the STEM disciplines, science and technology and engineering and mathematics with the deeper reflection stemming from the social sciences, the, the, the humanities and the artistic creation. And I mean, I, 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 I couldn't be more happy about the fact that this university is the first academic partner for Magic Leap. Uh, because as you will see when you see the dragon and when you explore the, the whale and when you go across and, and see all the demonstrations, it is just uh, an amazing, an amazing a example of that kind of, 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 of integration. Uh, it's, it's the computing power, but it's the constant reminder that this is a person-centered computer. I think uh, I'll, I'll give you three examples which uh, they're all happening on the same device. Um, uh, one person, literally in the last days, uh, just demonstrated the ability to walk into a room like this and to visualize Wi-Fi signal. You just see the Wi-Fi signal strength as little nodes all over a giant room in full space. And as you walk around it, you just you could see that. You can imagine like just visualizing complex data. Um, uh, well, one of the things we're showing here is you can uh, visualize walking into a big brain, and there's the brain. You could see it very, like, you know, analytic kind of things. Um, another thing we have, which I hope everyone gets to see and I hope a lot of students, is something called Tonandi, which makes no sense at all. It's all creative. It is, uh, we did it with a group from Iceland 
and you're just communing with sound spirits. It has no, like, if you're a hardcore engineer, you're like, what is the functional purpose of this? You're going to be completely lost. <laughs> um, you are just, and you're like, what does this do? And, and, and when I've seen some people uh, experience Anandi who are hyper analytical, they're looking for what's the data informational rationality of this thing. They're like, I don't know, I don't get it. It's a, but you'd almost have the same experience and put him to the art museum. I don't understand the purpose of this Picasso. Why, why is this dolly here? This is stupid. Why is the thing floating? It makes no sense. But if you use the other side of your brain, I've seen people break down and cry in Tonandi. Um, and they're not used to a computer, which they think of as a functional thing, being a delivery device for something super emotional. And I think if you actually, if you had a, a sociologist, which you do on campus, and you surveyed the students going through Tonandi, you can, you can figure out who was a left hemisphere, right hemisphere, and who's got both. Because you'll gauge by the reaction. And it's been really interesting to see that the, 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 some people are taught and they grow up shutting down one part of the brain or the other. And our hope is that people realize it's much better to unify that. I wonder if you could both talk a little bit about that. Because it's, it's easy for me as an engineer. You know, I am that guy who would not appreciate Tanandi. I'd be scratching my head. But it's easy for us to imagine how the computer scientist or the engineer or the architect would use this. Talk about it in terms of some other use cases like communication or education or even healthcare. I, I'd like to hear your thoughts, both of you, on that. Well, let me give you the, the image that um, uh, Ronnie just mentioned it quickly, but when Ronnie was describing this idea that you may be in a classroom and somewhere in another part of the world, there is another person and you have an avatar of that person, but you are now in a classroom where the, the professor and the students, you, can, you cannot actually tell apart who is physically there and who is you know, thousands of miles away as an avatar. And I was telling, and, and, and that as a vision for what is going to be true, a true global, a hemispheric and global education, is just an, an incredible, mm -hmm. uh, a, it's an incredible image of what we could be pioneering in this university. And that's why when I visited magically here in Plantation, um, as I was walking out, I was there with my son, and you know, we had been there, we signed our non-disclosure agreement, <laughs> we met with, with Ronnie, and as I was walking out into the glare of the bright uh, uh, South Florida sun, I just turned to my son and said, we just came back from the future, we just saw the future. And when you see the exhibits here, you, that's the impression you have, but it's here, it's the future here. So I was telling you, Ronnie, please use this university as your laboratory to try out all of these ideas because this is what university should be all about. It's about being at the cutting edge, trying out things. And I think the spirit of this university is perfectly suited to that. The, the, the last image I have is we were talking about this Hemispheric University Consortium where we now have 11 universities from all of the Americas thinking about um, um, you know, collaborating and student exchange. And Ronnie said, you know, with this technology, you could have the students from the University of, of Los Andes in Bogota actually walking on our campus, mm. their avatars. And one of the things that I had been worried about was, you know, we're thinking about the student mobility at a time when, you know, a lot of uh, legal barriers are being implemented for mobility. And this is one example where the awareness of space, of place, the power of place, can allow us to overcome the friction of space. And for me, this is very important because the whole idea of the Hemispheric University Consortium is based on the notion that students start college at exactly the same age in which they become citizens. If we can create a common educational experience, I think there is hope that those students will realize that all the stereotypes and the prejudice that are floating around there are simply not true. This is what happened with the Erasmus project in Europe. It helped to build this notion that there is a common humanity. 
Well, at a time when we're seeing the retrenchment from those values, this can be a truly liberating uh, technology. And that's why th those images of o overcoming the friction of space in this paradox where space is itself, sp where computing is itself sp spatial, is what I find to be the most fascinating element of, of your innovation. And, and it's, it's probably the first project for the philosophy department. There's, <laughs> there's actually, I think, a couple space paradoxes. One of them is um, the, the idea that it's so important to have space, but yet um, you can have 300,000 students from all over wandering around the same campus. The other space paradox, which is actually very, ar very architectural, is if I'm wandering around, let's say, a campus in Brazil and a campus in Berlin and and, and UM, they're all slightly geometrically different. So if, I, if I've mapped my Berlin campus and I'm walking down a pathway, do I suddenly appear like I'm just walking through the dorms or floating across the lake? So how do you map all these different spaces which are dropping on top of each other at the same time? So you might, in the beginning, have like um, special rooms. Like imagine this building, you had a copy of it in 10 other universities. Mm -hmm. With every chair in the same place, you would not have that problem. Mm -hmm. Like you could be uh, in Europe and you could be in Latin America and I could be here and you guys would be in the exact same place, I'd be the same place for you. We would all be co-present in the same exact physical geometry. So there's a lot of interesting like architectural philosophical problems when you start to merge physical and digital space in many different things. But it's a great problem for the campus to think about. Like are there hot spots where I'm going to go meet students from 100 other campuses and it's an intramural field, it's a big circle, and you walk into it and suddenly every other student from any university you connected to uh, suddenly can appear there. And you can talk to someone from another, and they, and they will just appear in front of you like they are, are there, they just don't have atoms. Um, so what, one of the examples I, I put up here is you were asking about education. So here's a professor who could be showing a bunch of like, uh, from, from, your, from your past, uh, you could be showing like radiology and x-ray information and then you could be conjuring full-size or even hyperscaled, you know, anatomy if you're, if you're in biomedical engineering or the medical school. And then you've got co-present TAs and co-present students who may be remote students. Um, they may be people afraid of being in a biology lab. They may be in another country coming in. Um, and you can imagine that at some point isn't weird at all. It's just a common occurrence. And everything we're showing there is actually something that could be built right now. Uh, you'll actually see examples of every single component uh, this week so, and what we want to do is put the tools in the hands of the student and the faculty um, and put enough units here so the students can action things. Like I hope tonight and tomorrow someone like decides they're going to start writing code and by the end of the week they build something. Uh, the nice part of this is it's not something you have to ponder and think for 10 years and then, you know, wait for five years to get an NSF grant. Um, students can band together with professors and make things like in days or hours or weeks and begin to action out. Now, over a course of a decade, I can't even imagine what would happen in a decade, but in one year, uh, uh, incredible things can happen if, if the campus gets motivated, and I think that's, that's our hope. Um, and it's not really about our, uh, it's, almost, it's not about our company, it's about the campus mm -hmm. taking a field and running with it and being the dominant player, uh, hopefully, you know, it could be the global dominant player in a new field of computing, which doesn't always happen that quickly. Um, like on the West Coast, they pretty much grab all fields of computing. There's an opportunity for UM to grab a new field, put its arms around it, and be the dominant global player ac academically. I think that's what's exciting. You know, one, one last thing that I, I found fascinating had to do with the, an earlier question. In, in, I think Magic Leap was also ahead of its time, not just in the technology, not, not just in this capacity to integrate left and right brain, but less left and, and right hemispheres, but also in actually selecting South Florida for its headquarters. Because <clears throat> uh, uh, what's happened since you decided to be this major first startup to locate here is that South Florida has become more and more a hub for innovation. It was about a, a month ago, the cover story on The Economist was about how Silicon Valley had become a victim of its own success. And the, the story is called Silicon Peak, it had sort of peaked. And there it cites a study of the Kaufman Foundation, which actually studies and follows entrepreneurship and innovation. And I was just amazed to read 
that the Miami, Fort Lauderdale area is now the part of the country with the largest number of startups and entrepreneurial projects. And so you were kind of leading the way, maybe because of your love for the place, again, the power of place, in locating here. But this could really become also a center of gravity for innovation. And we hope the University of Miami will play a central role in that vision. That would be incredible. So with study abroad located in, in my line of responsibility, I'm thinking of avatar abroad. So I'm just sort of, <laughs> I'm a little distracted here. Um, Ronnie, how important was it for you when you thought about partners, the, the type of freedom that a faculty member has to sort of think about these issues and have the freedom to sort of pursue these kind of questions as well as the research and stuff? Talk to me a little bit about why it was that a university was one of your first partners. Well, um, so universities in general and UM, I think it's very important for, you know, university is a mini universe. What you want is that freedom of thought, unrestrained, where you're not bound by anything other than what is the right thing and being intellectually curious. Incredibly important to like try things out um, before and be a leading edge before yeah, it's really out in the world at scale. Um, now that means UM will have to be moving pretty quickly because the world moves fast. But it's great to have like the frontal wave uh, where you can have a computer science person meet with the philosophy department and journalism and media and think through the good and bad consequences of doing things and to write about it, talk about it, debate about it on campus, where it's all possible very quickly because you're all co-located and you can, you can share information freely. Um, and I think specifically at UM, uh, it, it could be quite interesting because there's not like the, um, the you know, the, the, there's not a boundedness that you might find um, from some other universities that limit your thought process. So I, I think what's nice about Florida is that we're, we're wide open. It's like a blue ocean potential. Um, and it, it's unexpected thoughts could come from here. Uh, and that's really exciting. Um, people underestimate this area. They underestimate the whole thing. They think it's going to have to come out of some Ivy League this or that. I know you went to Harvard, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it may not happen. The free thinking may not happen in those places. Um, I think it's popular to drop out of an Ivy League school and then start a company, but it might be more popular to come to UM and go invent the future. I think that could be really interesting. And we see more and, and, and more st students from those areas coming here, and I think it's that, that spirit of, of not being bound by many an excess of, of traditions or constraints uh, where you know, you're already at a, at a decent level of excellence but there's so much room to grow that I think makes this place uh, particularly exciting. Well, right behind you, it's like the idea of freeing your mind, I think, is incredibly, uh, it's, it's our theme, but it's also, I think, why you go to university, uh, to unshackle your mind about things that may not be true and to discover things that are true. And to do that, you have to have a free mind and you have to have an open mind and you can't be full of biases or things. You need to be open-hearted, open mind. And I think it's a great uh, idea for being on a campus. Yeah. Well, I know on behalf of everyone, we want to thank both of you for your comments. And Ronnie, thank you for thank the you. opportunity. Thank you. So I think Ronnie and Julio will be sort of around to answer questions. Uh, for everyone else, please enjoy the reception. And Please also enjoy the demonstrations. They'll really blow your mind. It's fantastic. Thanks, everybody.